Hello, and welcome back to A History of Saps, Blackjacks, and Slungshots. So I'm really excited about this item here. I got it pretty recently, and it's an outlier within our group, but I do think it's related. Uh, it's my favorite item in my collection right now, in fact. It's just great. So, I'm calling this a bamboo kosh. Bamboo, because that's what it's made out of, primarily, and kosh because, as you might recall, that's a British term for a sap of any kind. And speaking of any kind, this is a peculiar kind, as you can tell. This doesn't look very much like anything else we've seen so far, does it? But I'm going to go ahead and count this as part of our group because it is a pocket club. It's weighted with lead. It uses leather to cushion the blow, at least somewhat. And in that sense, if none other, it does fit with our overall subject. The key item that was missing from that list, uh, you probably noticed, was flexibility. Now, this one this is completely inflexible, and that's what separates it from most saps and what makes it really different, but still related. This is related not just in terms of, you know, intention, you're kind of knocking someone out, causing them some pain, but not doing as much damage as possible, uh, but also in terms of uh, use and time. Now, I brought this one here in this video along at this point because this is pretty early in our weapons history, so I've been going chronologically, basically, you know, I kind of did an outline of the whole group, and I'm working my way through, so you can see the progression of the weapons. And this one, certainly, it's more of an outlier, and then it just stopped progressing. You don't see anything else like these, really, until way later. I don't think there's any connection, but they're still there and important, and these were used pretty early on, as far as our history is concerned. That history, as a reminder, goes from basically the 18th century to today, so 1700s up until today, at least in terms of the examples I can actually show you, the actual specimens, you know, the roots of our weapons uh, are ancient. So this one here, I found one, a grand total of one, uh, other example online from an antiques dealer a while back, and it was the exact same configuration, and they traced it to the Georgian era. So this would be more 1700s, maybe early 1800s. That being said, let's take a look at what we've got here. This is a nice hefty item, because it's big by, by our weapon standards for sure. And there's lead running along the length of it, so you can just see that there. It's, it's a hefty baton. Now the lead is not as... it doesn't have the same diameter as the bamboo. It would be really, really heavy if it did, so presumably there's a thin lead rod running through there. Now here's the business end. And you can see just how incredibly well-worn the leather is. Uh, that might be an indication that it got used a lot, uh, you know, in kind of a thrusting manner, uh, maybe over and over again. I was kind of thinking this might have to do with just the carry. This clearly did not just sit around in someone's house, because that could be from sitting in a pocket and just, you know, the motion of your walk constantly rubbing the leather against the bottom of the pocket or some kind of leather container. Could be. Something like that. There's an up-close look. You can see how even the side of the leather's really, really frayed. Now I want to concentrate on the striking head here. I'm going to leave it so we can focus on this part. Notice that dividing line about halfway through what's being shown right now, and that has leather as well. Interestingly, the one example I was able to find of this exact configuration had that exact same feature. So that seems really strange to me because you could have a bamboo tube, presumably stick your, you know, stick the leather rod in there, stuff it with leather, and you're good to go. But they both have that feature, and I don't know what that means. That's something to do with the construction. You don't need leather there in, in terms of striking or handling. I don't know what's going on. But here's a demonstration of how you could strike with it with either end if you grab it by the middle, which I think is another strong possibility. Uh, you know, it's a bamboo weapon, but I believe this is an English weapon. The person who was selling this sold it as kind of an East Asian kosh, and they thought it came from China or Japan. I've, after doing some research, my suspicion is that this is something that was brought, or, you know, produced maybe over there, but brought over for the English market, because there was a fascination with, you know, Asian things back then, and there's a lot of uh, persuaders and starters, in other words, uh, small clubs like this, that used what to them were exotic materials like this. The names Persuader and Starter, by the way, remember our weapons have just tons of aliases. Uh, those both indicate they use it to uh, encourage people. So if you remember how the Boats and Scosh was a, a disciplinary tool. This could have been used that way, but it seems to be described as more of a self-defense implement from the little material I was able to find. Now, going back to the grip, when I talked about the middle grip and being able to strike with either end, if this was produced in East Asia as more of an imitation or, you know their version of what they saw in, say, like, the, you know, the, the colonial era from British sailors and people like that, then I could see it being grabbed in the middle and used because that's more of a Yuara stick type weapon or kind of a Kubaton. 
but I would imagine your typical Englishman using this or just anyone European would grab it by the base where the lanyard is and uh, swing it like more of a typical bludgeon. And that makes the overall design here this really distinctive, rare, but, you know, at some point <laughs> in history, common design so strange. As if you're going to swing this thing, you'd think the leather would wrap much further down. Uh, you know, this kind of Q-tip type ends make it seem like it's more for jabbing and thrusting, but uh, we'll never know really what the common application was. It feels absolutely great in your hand, though. It's really well balanced. The diameter, the smooth but still kind of tactile feel of the, the polished bamboo feels great. This is just a great feeling weapon to, to handle in your hand. I think this could, be, could have been used at a high level. So, here's a surprise, right? Sneak preview of our next one, because while we're on the subject of impact weapons that are tangentially related to our subject, Here's what we're going to see next time, and this is a, it's not what you think, probably. Uh, this is a laminated leather, or synthetic, leather billy club, and they did have synthetic leather even way back then. So you can see the size, and comparing those two, see how they're part of a similar weapon strain. Even though the, the one I just showed a second ago that we'll get into later uh, was definitely more of an American thing. Speaking of this weapon strain, what's interesting about this one, too, is you think of it as, you know, a, a hard club other than those leather ends, but, in a way, it is a true sap in the sense that the real load here is the lead rod, which is in the very center. So there's something, and I, I wish I knew what, maybe just more leather, I have no idea, but there's something separating the true load from the exterior by quite a bit. So even though it's not going to feel good when that bamboo hits you at all, uh, the impact from the true metal load is still being diffused. So here's a look at the tail end. You can see that doesn't look like it got much use. Uh, that would be very useful for in-close fighting. When you get too close for a full swing, striking with the butt like that would definitely be a good option, but this one doesn't seem to have uh, been used that way. Seems more like, you know, again, if all that wear and tear on the front is from a thrust, then it was from that kind of motion there. Although, like I said, I have a, my own theory on why that might look the way it does. I haven't mentioned the lanyard yet, so I should do that real quick. It looks like a later addition to me. Uh, who knows how long ago, maybe even really recently, just to make it look a little better. I don't know, but that's fine. It doesn't bother me. Uh, the original probably would have had one like that. The buildings like this seem to have always had the lanyard. Uh, as a martial artist, I've always found it to be a little bit of an overrated feature. I don't think it's as handy as it seems. But either way, I didn't have to use it back in the day, so what do I know? So there it is. This is the bamboo kosh. I love this one. It's kind of a mystery... You know, cross-culturally, I'm not sure exactly when it's from or even where it was made. Just because it's made out of bamboo doesn't mean it was made in the East. I'd love to know more about it, but uh, it's quite intriguing and currently my favorite piece. Thank you.